Hey everybody, so we are standing right now at the intersection of Lewisburg Pike, heading south and north, Joe P. Road and Flat Creek Road. In the mid 19th century, this was an area known as Hertz Crossroads. The Hurt family lived here, owned a substantial amount of land around here. And on the night of November 28th, this area was the encampment for Federal Cavalry commanded by James Wilson. In the days leading up to November 29th and November 30th, Wilson had cobbled together a variety of cavalry detachments. And in the 24 to 48 hours before November 28th, he had been picketing the various crossings of the Duck River. He had moved north. Nathan Bedford Forrest begins pushing Wilson in this direction as Forrest is screening Hood's infantry movement. So early on November 29th, as the Confederate infantry begins to cross the Duck River east of Columbia and south of here, Forrest hits the Federal cavalry in this area and sort of a running battle begins heading north. Several casualties in this area. Eventually, Forrest veers off to the west, moving towards Spring Hill. This is really kind of an off the beaten path on the Tennessee campaign and, and sadly much of this area will be lost to development in the years to come. It's already a commercial building over here behind me off to really the southwest. There's going to be a series of homes built and so sadly all we'll be left with is an interpretive marker that really talks very little about what actually happened but it's, a, it's an important spot during the campaign as action ramps up on November 29th. This is one of my favorite spots from the early days of the Tennessee campaign. So this is the Hurt Cemetery. A lot of members of the Hurt family are buried here as well as the Glenn family. They owned virtually all the land around the area we were just at. So W.S. Hurt and his wife Mary Elizabeth lived here for years before the war and many years after it. Hurt's father had really settled in this area. So he's one of those first white settlers in the early 19th century. And they ran a post office, tavern, they had a place for people to stay. So it's sort of a multi-use facility. But we talk a lot about how families like the Carters and the McGavicks and, and various families from Columbia to Spring Hill all the way through Franklin and, and ultimately Nashville are all impacted by the events of late 1864. Well, so were the Hurts and the Glens because for about 24 hours, there were 5,000 federal cavalry encamped right in the center of their property. And soldiers will gather anything they can or anything they need. These families were also greatly impacted, but if you ever get a chance, come and see this. It's on Flat Creek Road, just east of Lewisburg Pike. We are standing on what is today John Sharp Road. This was part of the old Davis Ford Road Network, which was the route that John Bell Hood's infantry marched on November 29th. So that direction south toward Columbia, that direction north toward Spring Hill and Franklin. One of the things that I, I was very interested in is there was sort of this, it's a, it's a minor point in the big picture, but it was a really big point of controversy, particularly between Frank Cheatham and John Bell Hood in post-war years. John Bell Hood had said in his memoirs that within just a few miles of Spring Hill, he could see federal troops and wagons retreating northward toward Spring Hill. It was a very straightforward statement. Hood dies right around the time his memoirs were published. Frank Cheatham, four years later, in an article that was published initially in a Kentucky paper and then was reprinted many times, denied that completely. Cheatham said that the road was never visible from the moment they crossed the Duck River at Columbia until they got to Spring Hill. And I can tell you that is absolutely false because right behind me in the distance, you can see today with the naked eye, you can see the road. And if you can see today's modern, you know, whether it's a car or a truck and an SUV, this is not substantially different in size than, than a wagon or, you know, several men on horseback, let alone thousands and thousands of federal troops and well into the 1990s and early 2000s, there were people who took tours in this area who were told point blank that John Bell Hood was lying. They would take people to other spots and say, see, you can't see the road. Well, years ago, Sam Hood, who I've known for over 20 years, we actually got up on a hill, which is off to my right, which is actually probably 75 to 100 feet higher than where we're at right now. 
Well, if we can see the road from here, I assure you when we, and by the way, we were trespassing, when we got up on top of that hill, I mean, it was just so clear that Hood was telling the truth. We later were caught by the son of the man who owns the property, and for a minute, Sam and I thought we were in quite a fix. We ended up sitting in this guy's house talking about this very thing. So that's how familiar we had to be with the ground to really try and break through some of these I wouldn't even call them myths. They were just falsehoods about what had happened. Hood could see it. He could see the retreat was happening right there, which is why Hood wanted to move with all haste up this road because he knew time was running out. And on a straight line, we're about five or six miles from Spring Hill. So he told his infantry commanders to move at the double quick, get moving, block the road south of Spring Hill. The big thing to take away from a shot like this, from a place like this, being able to look at the road, being able to look at the terrain, being able to see what the Army saw that day, is to understand that they've still got almost four miles just to get to the southeast edge of town, and then before they even begin to deploy, they're already gassed. They've just done this incredible march from Columbia all the way here. By the time they get to Spring Hill, it's no wonder they're exhausted. Hey there everybody, we're at Ripa Villa right now and we are outside on the back edge of the property and we are just at about the halfway point of where General William Bates Confederate Division of about 2100 men will advance through on the afternoon of November the 29th, 1864 as they move towards blocking the Columbia Turnpike. Moving 2100 men in a full division like this is a lot easier said than done. Looking at the map, it's easy to just point from point A to point B, but the ground that they'll have to cover, the hills that they'll have to traverse, the creeks that they will have to wade, will prove to be a very difficult obstacle on their way to achieving their objective. Arriving here in Spring Hill late afternoon, sometime around 3, 3.30, and then by 4 o'clock, three divisions begin this northwesterly movement towards Spring Hill, towards blocking the Columbia Turnpike. We've already done a video on General Patrick Claiborne's advance, so we won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but we will really will follow the footsteps of Bates' division as we advance through this next portion of, of the video. So we're down along Johnson's Branch. We're east of Ripa Villa, probably about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile. William Bates' division is moving from that direction westward. The problem is not just this creek bed. There's a huge ravine, especially on that side of the creek, which is a major impediment. And as Joseph pointed out earlier, moving a division really anywhere is a lot easier said than done. So as Bates' division approaches this area, his unit certainly had to either break or shift its course. So we're going to hit the next spot, which is just up the creek bank. All right, hey everybody, so check it out. Look at the ravine behind me. The creek's right here, the ground raises up. You can see this sort of jumble of trees and dead trees and logs. So there's a couple of things to consider. Civil War armies are always having to encounter some either obstacle created by nature or some civilian issue. So the civilian issue here is the chairs have lived on this property for decades, but areas like this were almost completely uncleared. You couldn't farm this, this low ground. You couldn't farm these slopes. So there are trees that always are lining these banks. So the trees are a problem. The creek is a problem. Just the terrain itself and Bates' men, as well as everybody else in Cheatham's Corps and everybody in the Confederate Army, has already marched about 16 or 17 miles up and down the uh, hills of Middle Tennessee just to get here. And then they encounter this late in the afternoon of the 29th as they're trying desperately to push west, block the pike south of Spring Hill, and cut off the U.S. Army. We are on a really, really cool piece of ground. Everything kind of around me and behind me is owned by the American Battlefield Trust. This ground was saved just over a decade ago after the economic collapse of 2008. This was all going to be developed. The trust bought it and in conjunction with this property and what the city of Spring Hill owns just to my right, there's about 170 acres of what was once Ripa Villa, but what's really part of the Spring Hill battlefield that's all preserved. This is the area of the final stages of William Bates' approach to Columbia Pike, which is right behind me. We're probably seven or 800 yards from the road. You might be able to see some of the traffic moving north and south behind me. As Bates' men 
are traversing this ground. Claiborne's division has already become, become engaged to my left and sort of to the northeast. In just a few hundred feet, Bate gets the order to stop, which is really one of the major components of the debacle that unfolds because his approach to the road is uncontested. There's no enemy in front of him. There are enemy troops coming up from the south. A small regiment of Ohioans are pushed away from the pike by Bate skirmishers. But really, the road, the road literally wide open to Columbia Pike from this vantage point, but everything changes in a matter of minutes. We're clearing across the same ground that Bates' division came over, and if you look just off over my shoulder here, you'll see Ripa Villa in the distance, and it would later become apparent to William Bate that Thomas Ruger's division is just about a mile to the south of us, and Ruger evidently must have seen Bates' division advancing towards the road, uh, otherwise he would not have veered off of the road and waited just a mile to the south. Nevertheless, over this ground, Bates' division will continue their advance, and then he gets the order to halt. From that point forward, spirals into all of the chaos that will unfold that night, and between all of the division commanders, and then just the serial paralysis that will take over the entire Confederate Army. But looking off in that distance over there, you can see just how close, just how close the Confederate Army came to blocking the road, just how close Hood's men came to achieving their objective here at Spring Hill. It was an objective that was never really quite realized. So we're at the final spot on our uh, Spring Hill campaign tour today. Th this really is a very, very powerful spot. You know, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's the faint echo of traffic behind us. And a lot of people have asked me through the years, how did the Confederates not know that the Federal Army was moving up the road all night? There are ample facts that many of the rank and file Confederates suspected something was up. They could hear something in the distance. This is about where Bates' division stopped. Bates later reported his main battle line was within 200 yards of the road. His skirmishers, about 100 yards from the road, kind of down in, as the ground starts to slope away. But they were pulled back by orders from General Cheatham. They moved to the northeast to reconnect with Claiborne. And then Ed Johnson's division of Stephen D. Lee's Corps occupied this area for the balance of the night. The marker back here, which was put up about a decade ago, denotes roughly the area where the left flank of Johnson's division was. And from this area, you can see we're on a slightly elevated piece of ground. It's no wonder the Federal soldiers all night said they could see campfires twinkling really as far as the eye could see. This area was sort of a wash in this faint glimmering light. The Confederates, I think many suspected something was up, but they just didn't know exactly what that was. Most of them, rank and file guys, you know, mid-range officers, the generals all the way up to Hood, could have never suspected that John McAllister Schofield would move his entire army up this road. There's Ripa Villa. You can see the turnpike as it runs to the south. That Schofield would move his entire army, 25,000 plus, 800 supply wagons, thousands of horses and animals, artillery, and just slip away. They moved north to Thompson Station. They eventually ended up in Franklin. For me, this ground has always been so important because to understand what happens the next day, you have to come here. You have to see how close the Confederates came to blocking the pike. And the truth is, we don't know what happens if they block the road. Does Schofield surrender? Does Schofield fight his way through? Hard to say. It's all what ifs. So if you get a chance, especially this time of year, you've got to come and see this ground. Walk the ground. You can feel it. You know, you can, you can feel the energy of that almost 160 year ago event. And um, it's just a wonderful place to visit. <music>